understanding why it is you can't stop smoking weed, understanding what goes on inside of you that causes you to need to smoke weed all the time in all kinds of different therapy approaches, in substance use, treatment, and all kinds of ways that our mental health system or we as people or whoever it is tries to address addiction. In my opinion, they're all secondary to the thoroughness of a spiritual program. A 12-step program doesn't have to be exactly that, but something along that line. There's a weight that we're all carrying around in this journey, and that weight will be relieved. In step four, we really get to dig out the dirt. We get to empty the skeletons in the closet. We get to stop hiding from the world and really build that courage to look ourselves in the face and really accept responsibility for who we are, what we've done, why we're doing the things we're doing, and to move forward and to ultimately free ourselves from this torment that we have been punishing ourselves with for so long. It's been a long time since I've done one of these videos, but I'm going to return to step four from the Life with Hope book, and we are going to read through it and make some commentary as we go along. Step four made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. After we became honest enough to take the first step, open-minded enough to take the second, and willing enough to take the third, we were ready to confront step four. We have observed what happens to those who resist this step. Some marijuana addicts will not follow the suggestion to do this step or to do it promptly. Some of them stop coming to meetings and start using again. Others keep coming back, but their spiritual awareness does not grow. They recount the same experiences, express the same emotions, and suffer the same pain. Nothing changes for them. They appear to be stuck. We learned that as long as we resisted taking our inventory, we put our sobriety and our lives at risk. Just as denial once stopped us from seeking recovery, defiance, shame, and fear can hinder our spiritual growth. Once we made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to a higher power, it was imperative that we do just that. After all, the faith we acquired by taking step three meant very little if we did not follow it with immediate action. So let's just have a bit commentary on that. There is a stress there that you take step four sort of promptly so that you don't linger. I think that oftentimes people are rushed through this process and that often leads to a lack of thoroughness. As it says, a searching and fearless moral inventory that in my opinion implies thoroughness. And sometimes if we do this too quickly, we do not really understand what it is we're trying to dig out, right? Or what the skeletons really are. We don't see them clearly. We don't understand ourselves. And we haven't built the self-respect yet to actually do this properly, per se, right? Or to believe that we are worthy of freeing ourselves from this mess, so I think there is a bit of a skillfulness here is you don't have to rush into it right away. You do want to build that deep foundation of self-respect, responsibility, accountability to your sponsor and to other people in your life. And I think that puts you on, on firm bedrock in which you can then do this really thoroughly. So let's keep going here. The disease of addiction impaired our ability to know ourselves and to be true to ourselves. Regardless of our way of life, our denial about our disease coupled with a lack of self-awareness kept us in an endless loop where we practiced the same destructive behaviors again and again, while always expecting different results, right? So that again, is this idea, this Einstein idea of doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results, definition of insanity. and Yes, until we really understand ourselves and what motivates us and we have the tools to deal with that, we will just keep repeating those patterns. Step four is a fact-finding process meant to put an end to this interminable cycle by identifying those facets of our character that blocked us 
from a relationship with a higher power. Step four required courage. Some people believe that our instincts have been given to us by a higher power and exist for a purpose. A desire for material, emotional, and sexual security ensures our survival as a species. As addicts, we allowed our healthy instincts to get out of control. These feelings drove us, dominated us, and ruled our lives. They became warped and exaggerated. The pursuit of these desires caused pain and suffering to the people in our lives. They in turn reacted and we ultimately resented it. A simple way you could summarize that is character instincts or human instincts run amok. Basically our natural desires as are, as is mentioned here, get out of balance and we pursue these things in ways that are very destructive to ourselves and ultimately to the people around us. So this fact finding mission, this facing your shadow, this openness and willingness to really dig deep takes courage. And it is really the transition of you changing your life. We all had our own patterns to find. Sometimes with the help of our sponsors, we found there are, there were certain similar threads woven through many of our lives. We were not terminally unique. We indulged ourselves in fruitless searches for people and outside factors we could blame for the spiritual emptiness of our lives. We alternated between blaming ourselves and blaming others. We were often quite childish. Our ability to experience emotions was impaired. We held on to resentments about the past, which prohibited us from embracing the present and living our lives to the fullest. Some of us were full of remorse and could not forgive ourselves for making mistakes. That is, we would not accept our humanity. This is a great calling. And if you watch some of my other content, this idea of self-compassion, accepting ourselves as flawed humans that we're not uniquely fucked up, we all have our own issues clearly, is a huge process of healing and recovery. Learning to understand we are human beings, we are messed up like everyone else is a huge process of this. Letting go of this fear or this tight grip we have on denying that or refusing to accept that is a huge process again. And I hope that you find your way there. We were full of fear. Those fears stopped us from doing what needed to be done. Some of us were delusional. We lived in a private world that no one else shared. Perhaps we considered suicide, were otherwise depressed, or found ourselves unable to interact with other people. Maybe we were desperately lonely. For many of us, our self-pity became anger at the world for mistreating us. For some, this anger escalated into rage. Some of us lied, cheated, and stole in a vain attempt to fulfill our desires for material, emotional, and sexual security. That's pretty hardcore, right to the point, right? So we, we were so frustrated and stuck in this horrible pattern. And rather than looking in the mirror and accepting responsibility for our situation, we point the finger at everyone else. And you know that saying, when there's a finger pointed outward, there's three back pointing at you. Okay, so this is about you accepting responsibility for your shit and not blaming the world for it. Within the fellowship, we found that many of us had done the same kinds of things, had felt the same, and had experienced similar thoughts. We were compulsive, were obsessive, and could not express the full range of human emotions. Full of fear and resentments, we identified with those who were still in the same place. And we wanted to follow those who had found the way out. This is the whole point of group healing. Nobody exists on their own. We need each other. And so we want to learn from other people who have been there before us, right? Who can show us or who lead by example on what it actually means to recover, what it means to be courageous, to act with integrity, to be responsible. We want to find people like that and learn from them. Taking inventory is not a thinking exercise. It is a writing exercise. By getting our experiences on paper, we began the process of shedding our resentments, remorse, and fear. We discovered the patterns of behavior that allowed us to be needlessly hurt or that we had used to harm others. 
Did our anger, fear, belligerence, defiance, and denial combine with our disease to lead us to hospitals, jail cells, or gutters? Were we derelicts who were unable to support our families or ourselves? Were we functioning as marginal members of society, stuffing our feelings and becoming furtive, neurotic bundles of unexpressed emotion? That's amazing. Were we quick to blame society and our fellow human beings for our woes? Were we hypocrites who justified engaging in an explicitly illegal activity? Were we full of tremendous insights, but unable to follow through with the vast projects we envisioned? Were we creatures of appetite using other drugs, alcohol, sex, food, or other people to try to wrest satisfaction out of the world? Were we talented people with fantastic potential who, even if we found success, could not savor it? Regardless of our career triumphs or artistic achievements, did we feel unfulfilled? And even though we had many social relationships, did we feel a lacking, an emptiness? Were we egoists forever seeking approval? Wow, that is intense. And you could unpack that paragraph for a very long time. There's so many good questions there. And again, this is about facing our shadow, facing our darkness. And as someone in recovery myself, as a therapist who studied lots of different modalities, these questions and this heroic journey of doing this inventory is is absolutely one of the very best things you can do to develop enlightenment, to be, to have a spiritual experience, to become resilient, to transcend the egoic madness of being a human being. I really encourage you to do this, take this seriously. And even in the comments right now, ask any questions, post any questions or reflections that you have about this type of stuff. When we put pen to paper, the answers to questions like these began to appear. We began to realize that the injuries and offenses against us, real or imagined, had kept us mired in fear and anger. We began to see our part in what had happened to us. We gained a new understanding about those who had harmed us. We saw that they were often spiritually sick or misguided, just like us. We found that we had a role in some of our supposed misfortune. A rigorously honest inventory showed us that we might have stepped on the toes of others in a misguided, drugged, and self-centered quest for happiness and fulfillment. Thus, we gained insight into our relationships. Many people describe addiction as a seeking of God, right? We're seeking something to fill this bottomless pit inside our stomach. And this is what we're, again, trying to attune to, realizing that that is a bottomless pit, that no amount of food, sex, drugs, whatever it is that we stuff in our mouths is going to change that. So this is about letting go of some of that and connecting to something that will really a higher power, a spiritual experience, a higher self, whatever words you want to use guides us, right? Or that is there. It's part of the universe. It's here. We're all part of it. And we can connect to that, but we can't until we clean house and again, empty those skeletons out. And this is, this is what we're doing. Many of us were afraid to start this process, but we finally became so uncomfortable that we had to do something. At this time, we sought guidance and direction from our sponsor. We did not have to take this journey alone. We can't take this journey alone, I will say. We asked our higher power for the willingness, strength, and courage to look at ourselves honestly, fearlessly, and thoroughly. We did this each time we sat down to write, whether it was one time or several. There are many ways to do the fourth step. It is not an autobiography. One suggestion follows. First, we made a list of our resentments. We listed our resentments of people, places, things, and principles. You should probably write institutions there as well ideas. Next to that, we wrote why we had each resentment. We then wrote down how it had affected us. Did it affect our self-esteem or our personal relationships? Maybe it had affected our material or emotional security or sex relations. Were our ambitions, social, physical security, or sexual threatened? After that, we had to do some real soul searching. What were our own wrongs and mistakes? Where were our faults? shortcomings or defects. 
What was our part in each resentment? Were we selfish or dishonest? Had we been self-seeking or frightened? Had we been inconsiderate? Remember, this was our personal inventory. We had to disregard the other side and look only at our part. We had to be rigorously honest with ourselves and admit our shortcomings on paper. We did the same thing with all of our fears. We listed the fears and then why we had each one. We wrote how each fear affected us and our part in it. Next, we reviewed our sexual conduct, making a list of our partners and determining in which relationships we were selfish. Whom did we harm? Whom did we use? Whom had we taken advantage of? What did we do? What could we have done instead? How did it affect us? Excuse me. We were thorough in all of this. When we listed any other moral issues that did not seem to fit into the previous categories, including times we lied, cheated, stole, or harmed others, we also listed any secrets that we had not mentioned so far. Experience had taught us that we are as sick as our secrets. Oh, I love that line so much. This really is a freeing experience. And if you're really committed to changing your life, you will write it all down and you will get it all out. And I promise you, you will feel better. There's a weight that we're all carrying around in this journey and that weight will be relieved. I really encourage you to go through this. After we listed and analyzed our resentments, we began to realize that they no longer had as much power over us. We began to see that the negative traits and behaviors we had practiced and may even have once enjoyed or regarded as pleasurable would no longer work in our lives. It became possible to face our fears with the help of our higher power. We knew what we were afraid of and why. In the instant that we faced our fears, we began to overcome them. After we took stock of our relationships, both sexual and otherwise, we began to look at these relationships differently and with less selfishness. Just want to reiterate that the instant we faced our fears, we began to overcome them. This is a truism that's passed down through the millennia and even formalized in modern psychological interventions. We need to face our fears. We need to learn to deal with things that are difficult. And by doing that, we transcend them and we become stronger. And that's a wonderful thing to know. This really is an incredible process that will free you. I promise you that it's been proven by millions of people. Okay. Over the last however many years through this program and throughout the millennia. Once we had written down everything that we had been unwilling to deal with for so long, we were finally free to look at what was right in us. For many of us, it was just as important to list our positive assets and attributes. Many of us discovered that we had low self-esteem. We learned that we are neither all bad nor all good. We are simply human. The fourth step opened windows for us. We rediscovered the many people who had helped us along the way and gained a new appreciation for our loved ones, friends, spiritual guides, and teachers. We began to transform our fears into faith and started to find a new way to love unconditionally. Our attitude of denial and defiance began to change into an attitude of gratitude. Some of us did not get it all the first time, so we did other inventories as more memories surfaced. There's nothing wrong with that. Taking inventory is a process we can repeat. However, once we began to look at our attitudes and behaviors with energy and honesty, we found the process to be more joyful than difficult. I agree with that. The pain of doing the fourth step was a lot less than the pain we would have held on to by not doing this step. It pays dividends beyond any that can be anticipated. Absolutely. After writing our fourth step, we discovered both a new appreciation for our strengths and an acceptance of our weaknesses. We reread our inventory. Sitting alone, we reviewed it carefully. We asked God to help us find any important things we might have left out. We made certain that our admissions were thorough and honest. We were ready to take step five. Okay, well, that leaves the reading. Okay, and just a couple notes on that. There are other videos about resentment on this channel that I think you probably would find helpful. Although that aside, this process is tremendously empowering and freeing and enlightening. 
And I just want to remind you that letting go of that fear, stepping into this, being courageous and really going for it is an amazing experience. I hope and I wish that you get to experience it. If you have any questions, again, send a comment, ask a question, share this video with someone you think might find it helpful. And that's about it. I will get back to these readings and we'll record more. But until then, I wish you all the best. Take it easy. Peace out. I am very grateful that you watched to the end of this video. Please click one of the boxes to watch more of our content. And otherwise, have a great day. Peace out.